Okay. Um, I'm glad uh, we're all together. Um, when I titled the sermon, The God of Second Chances, I didn't know that um, we'd be given a second chance to have true corporate worship today, but here we are, and uh, it certainly fits. So I'll just jump in asking God to bless us where we are. Uh, and those who are not able to be with us, um, I'm hoping they're okay. I hope they're not dealing with things that um, are so troubling that um, they're beside themselves. So that's a little prayer as we open. Uh, as I look back on my own life, uh, I see something I wouldn't have expected to see when I was, say, 20 or 30, uh, that my life's been punctuated with a whole lot more second chances than I ever would have ex expected or predicted. Um, because, you know, things seldom play out as we expect. Instead, uh, you know, life's full of things that weave in and out, like people who come and go and come back again. Um, we get unexpected career opportunities. We have certain dreams that don't exactly materialize, but they don't go away completely either. It's pretty complicated. Well, here's a story on that from a man named David Wood uh, on, you know, our vicissitudes. That's a $10 word for stuff. <laughs> he writes, Carol and I, Carol, Caroline and I dated in college. We planned to get married, but at the end of our junior year, we had a big argument and called it off. When I returned after summer vacation, I wanted to patch things up, but <clears throat> she was already engaged to someone else. Six months later, she was married. Two years after that, I traveled from Oregon to Pennsylvania by bus to attend my brother's wedding. Along the way, I made a detour to New York City to see Janice, a, a woman I dated briefly after Caroline, and I invited Janice to the wedding. And for two full weeks, she stayed at my mother's house, helping with the preparations. After the wedding, Janice and I were engaged with astounding speed. I accepted my role of future husband like a high school actor accepting a minor role in a school play. Janice returned to New York, and I took a Greyhound to Florida <clears throat> to visit my father. While there, I ran into Caroline's brother, my old girlfriend, Caroline, who told me that Caroline had separated from her husband. I felt something shift within me. She was at Harvard, he says, working on her law degree. I asked her brother if he thought she might like to see me. Actually, he said, she's been wondering if she'd ever run into you again. After a few more beers, I convinced the brother to call Caroline. She seemed surprised when I got on the phone. I could drop by for a visit, I said. It's on my way home. I was heading back to Oregon, and only the South Pole would have been a bigger detour, and we both knew it. She said that a visit would be all right with her. So two days later, the Greyhound dropped me off near Harvard, and I walked the streets at midnight looking for her address. She said she could spare only one day, but I would have been happy with five minutes. I found the house and knocked on the door. Caroline answered in her bathrobe and invited me in. It was late, but we stayed up talking. I told her about my fiancé, and she told me about her studies. At some point, she began crying, and then I began to cry. And 24 hours later... I was back on the Greyhound, bound for Oregon, now engaged to two women and wondering what I was going to do about it. <laughs> the story of Eli and Samuel in this morning's lesson uh, is also about second chances, um, specifically second chances at parenting. Eli and his Sons have become strangers to one another, if not actually, then at least kind of morally. Now, most times when I've spoken about this passage, um, Samuel and his calling has been my principal focus, as it was 
uh, with Bunny's Wonderful Children sermon. But the incredibly um, sketched, no, um, etched portrait of the prophet Eli and the extraordinary pathos, uh, the judgment of God on him evokes, looms so large here that to ignore those things would be to do a disservice to this text. And besides, I I wonder if, if there aren't a lot more Eli's than there are Samuel's in our church. Uh, you know, uh, it seems to me that what kind of benefit you get from the Bible stories has everything to do with who you choose to identify with inside them. Oftentimes, I believe it's, it's more fruitful to identify with characters other than the heroes, other than, you know, Samuel or David, for instance, or the prodigal son. Identifying with troubled old King Saul in the David stories instead of David is uh, sometimes uh, interesting, especially if we've gone into rough patches uh, uh, in our careers. Or uh, looking at the prodigal son story, identifying uh, instead of with the prodigal son, identifying with the cranky older brother. Uh, that can help give us some self-understanding. It holds a, a mirror up to us. And, and so can identifying in this story with Eli. Now, Eli is a pretty old guy. He must be 50. No, I'm kidding. He's much older. I'm guessing Eli's got cataracts. His, his hearing may be going. He's not as steady on his feet as he once was. He's, he's living as if his life were already over. Maybe he wonders why God hasn't come for him yet. Why God hasn't already passed the ruling of God's people onto his sons. But when he thinks about his sons, Eli can't help but become a bit uneasy. I mean, deep down, he knows something about them that he doesn't really want to know, right? That they just don't measure up. That the life that he planned for them as upstanding leaders, uh, you know, just doesn't fit. But then every one of us parents has to deal with our hopes and expectations of our kids in some way, sometime or other, right? What Eli, what Eli doesn't know is that God's been working on this problem of leadership succession in Israel for a very long time. In fact, that's why there's this little kid named Samuel who's sleeping in the temple at Shiloh, quote, in the room where the light never goes out. Uh, he's very much like, you know, the light of God, uh, a tiny flame, but constant, and he represents the future. Little Samuel's presence there is no accident. He he doesn't know it yet, but he's apprenticing for something a lot bigger than altar, altar boy, you know, in God's holy temple. Uh, so the passage opens with uh, the offhand remark that this was a time when, quote, the word of God was rare. Visions were not widespread, as Bunny uh, pointed out. But as everyone will find out, uh, that isn't to say that God has been off duty. Not at all. You may remember the, the, the story from uh, as long ago as Sunday school, how, you know, God wakes Samuel from his little boy's sleep, as Bunny told us, three times, in fact. But it's up to Eli to figure out who it is who's really speaking. And finally, when Samuel's tuned in, uh, God gives him a particularly hard word to deliver to Eli. I have told Eli that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Isn't that a zinger? Eli is judged to be a much too permissive parent. And he's about to pay for it dearly. That's, that's a real hard text. Well, 19 summers ago, uh, I had a sabbatical. And I was given the extraordinary privilege of studying with a famous pediatric psychiatrist uh, named Dr. Robert Coles, who coincidentally taught at Harvard. Uh, he has spent a, a lifetime studying and reporting on the inner life of our nation's greatest treasure, our children. And he's also the Pulitzer Prize winning author of a book called The Spiritual Life of Children and another one called The Moral Life of Children. 
And he once wrote an essay entitled, The Need for No, N-O. For several years, in, in addition to his duties lecturing at Harvard, he, he was also teaching fourth grade reading in an inner city elementary school to children of very impoverished circumstances. Dr. Cole said that from the beginning, it was a difficult assignment. The, the kids were often just downright rude, uh, thinking uh, nothing at all of getting up and leaving the room while he was in the act of speaking to them. Well, at first he cut them a lot of slack, never forgetting that they'd lacked the advantages that he'd had growing up. But one morning he lost his patience completely picked up a blackboard pointer and slammed it down on his desk while shouting the word, no. Absolute silence followed. Then he told them off and more silence followed. Finally, a little girl broke the ice. Let's just start out all over again, she said. And then Dr. Coles reflects. In truth, he says, I was the one who needed to do so. I knew in the abstract that children ought not to be allowed to get away with being spiteful, callous, defiant. Weeks earlier, I should have acted on that knowledge. Let those children hear me say no loud and clear, even as all our children of whatever background need to learn what is permissible and what is decidedly not. Unfortunately, all too many of us have come to believe that children ought to be spared the no's. That in some way they'll be hurt or traumatized by being made aware firmly that certain words and deeds are utterly impermissible, that, that limits exist and will be consistently upheld. Well, then he backtracks a little. To be sure, the word no can be abused. It can become a chorus of refusals that indicate parental callousness or worse. But he says the word no used judiciously can also be a sign of caring concern. Children have to learn, even before they start school, that boundaries go with life, that impulses must contend with rules for everyone's sake. The worst thing that we can do to our children is to leave them at the mercy of their impulses. Hmm. Well, leaving children to the mercy of their own impulses. Uh, I doubt that many people are familiar anymore with William Gibson's play, The Miracle Work, Worker. Uh, those of us who are older will surely remember it. Uh, it was famous once and was made into a film with Anne Bancroft. In the story of Helen, it's, excuse me, it's the story of Helen Keller, uh, born in 1880 and disabled by scarlet fever, which left her blind and deaf uh, at three uh, she was left by her parents at the mercy of her own impulses. That's how it connects with our story today. Helen, uh, in the play and in the movie, acts like a wild animal uh, when uh, finally her salvation in the form of a teacher, Annie Sullivan, arrives. Remember, Anne's uh, only three, excuse me, uh, Helen's only three. Well, Annie assesses the situation one wild child and two totally indulgent parents. She insists that she be given total charge of Helen for two weeks. Well, the parents reluctantly give their assent. And in two weeks, Helen goes from being impossible to being quite compliant. Her parents are thrilled. How great. Let's bring her home, they say. They're satisfied that uh, she's learned the meaning of the word no. Annie Sullivan, though, insists that Helen needs to learn more than the meaning of no. She also has to learn the meaning of yes. I mean, look, life isn't ultimately about self-control and learning to delay gratification. However, we all know that a person has to learn those things first in order to get anywhere in life. Well, years later in Helen Keller's autobiography, The story of my life, Helen explains how she learned the meaning of yes. Annie and I were walking down the path to the well house, she says, attracted by the fragrance of the honeysuckle with which it was covered. Someone was drawing water, and my teacher placed my hand under the spout. As the cool stream gushed, 
over one hand, she spelled into the other the word water, first slowly, then rapidly. I stood still, my whole attention fixed upon the motions of her fingers. Suddenly, I felt a misty consciousness as of something forgotten, a thrill of returning thought, and somehow the mystery of language was revealed to me. I knew then that W-A-T-E-R meant the wonderful, cool something that was flowing over my hand. That living word awakened my soul, gave it light, hope, joy, set it free. There were barriers still, it's true, but barriers that could in time be swept away. I learned a great many new words that day, said Helen. I do not remember what they all were, but I do know that mother, father, sister, and teacher were among them, words that were to make the world blossom for me. It would have been difficult, she says, to find a happier child than I was as I lay my, in my crib at the close of that eventful day and lived over the joys it had brought me, and for the first time longed for a new day to come. Well, I could end the sermon there just fine, I suppose. Uh, but again, we're dealing here with more than the child Samuel. We're also uh, looking into the heart of the damaged uh, old Eli. Uh, he's not looking forward to the coming of a new day. He'd, he'd be happy right now if all his days were over. Uh, he reacts quite resignedly to God's judgment, if you remember. Uh, perhaps he knew it was coming. He says to Samuel, tell me everything God said to you. Don't you dream of hiding a thing. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And then Eli said, it is the Lord. Let the Lord do what seems good to the Lord. Well, someone like Eli then is, is left with a choice either to detest Samuel for being a reminder of his own shortcomings as a dad, or to appreciate the boy as a gift of God, someone he can mentor, start over with, be given a second chance. Uh, indeed, the most palpable confirmation of the fact that God forgives us our faults is the evidence of those new opportunities that we find, new chances to give it another go, <clears throat> even if, as with Eli, we might be in our 70s or 80s. Again, here, we're talking about second chances. Uh, and let me offer one more contemporary example. A month before her mother died, uh, a woman named Noella Evans made a decision. The hardest one she'd ever made, she says. She decided uh, to move her mother from her apartment where she'd lived with reasonable independence into a facility where she could receive a level of care she wasn't quite ready for, but would probably need some time fairly soon. Uh, here's her account of what happened, uh, told in her own words. She says, en route to sign the necessary papers, I ached to bring her home with me. But thoughts about my job, my young son, and space restrictions got in the way of my heart. I did not realize that just a few weeks later, our time together would come to an end. I remember, in fact, the exact stoplight where this inner struggle caused me such pain. And it still hurts to see that my priorities were so misplaced. A year later, I was assisting on a tour to study culture and customs in Indonesia when an older traveler became ill. While the group made day tours, she remained in her room growing weaker and more unable to tend to her own basic needs. She was determined to ride this thing out on her own and refused offers of assistance and even medical help. Well, finally, one evening, I simply walked in and began to bathe and care for her. This is not part of your job, she said. You don't have to do this. But I did. I told her that I had been unable to assist someone very dear to me at a time when I was needed. And I was not going to make that mistake again. As a result, something in me healed, she says. 
well, grandparenting or even mentoring children, uh, I'm thinking of the second chance given to Eli, uh, are, are precious bonus opportunities offered to, to many of us. Uh, second chances. When we feel that life is over for us or ought to be, it's amazing, I think, what signs of grace can actually present themselves. So before I close, I want to take us back for one quick look at the life of Annie Sullivan, Helen Keller's teacher and friend. Um, few people know that as a young girl of seven, Annie Sullivan lost her mother. Her alcoholic father then put Annie, suffering herself from a form of near blindness, and her younger brother, who was crippled from tuberculosis, in an orphanage. There her brother died, and Annie blamed herself for the loss, even though no seven-year-old in the world could be held responsible for the death of a smaller sibling. But look at it this way. The incredible work of will and courage needed to give a form of sight and hearing to Helen Keller was not something that came out of thin air. No, it was Annie Sullivan's response to be, to be given a second chance. So as this new year opens, let me ask us all, what might God be bringing to birth for us who who carry our own unhealed wounds? What second chances may loom for us? What form might they take? Uh, God knows. And uh, maybe we, maybe we do too. Amen.